Hi, Ella. How are you today? Very great. How are you? I'm not sure where you're located, but I'm here in Washington, D.C. I'm in Los Angeles. Hey, excellent. Excellent. So I just realized you are in Washington and your last name is Washington. That is correct. <laughs> it was meant to be. You were always going to go to Georgetown. That's what they always say. It was meant to be. Well, I'm actually looking forward to speaking to you because I read your book and I found it very engaging. I think you have a very nice way of writing about very complicated topics. Oh, thank you. That's such a compliment. I'll tell you why. Because when I read your book, I felt you were not apportioning blame. You know, when people write about these subjects, they have anger, resentment. And I didn't feel any of those things when I read your work. Mm -hmm. And I felt if I speak to you, you're probably going to have a very bubbly personality because... <laughs> Because you can see it in your writing. You have such a nice way of writing about such a complicated subject. You know, thank you. That That's really kind of you to say. And, you know, I, as a Black woman, um, you know, I've seen all of the negatives, right? And, yes. I, and I know how often, you know, this these conversations turn immediately to the negatives and the wrongs that have been done in society. Um, and all of that is very relevant. And we can't forget about it. Yes. But what I want people to do is to buy into the idea that we are not placing blame. We are holding we are holding people accountable and holding organizations accountable. But we all have a responsibility to have to forge a pathway forward. And so for me, that is, I guess, the the tone um, that I try to take. I, I certainly don't want to skirt around any important issues or, you know, let people off the hook for things they should be accountable yes. for. But I really do want everyone to see themselves in the journey in some way. Um, and so I'm so glad that it came across like that. And I'm so grateful. The thing that's interesting for me is that some of the companies you case studied, they're not companies I would traditionally want to read about because they're not mm -hmm. sectors that necessarily interest right. me. Right. But you wrote it in such a nice way that I, I actually read through each of the chapters. Oh, that is so that is so good to hear. Thank you for I truly am grateful for the feedback. Um, I, I really do. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And it, yeah, it was one of those things that I was like, oh, well, people, you know, want to read about IOR health if they're not in healthcare. But will they read about they do they care about Slack if they're not in technology? Yes. Or they, they've never even heard of Infosys. So I'm so glad that it resonated in the way that I was hoping that it would. That's the reason why I wanted to start with this, is that. One of the reasons I stopped reading certain newspapers because I felt that their tone around certain topics were too aggressive. It turns people off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you can make people feel comfortable discussing a sensitive topic, they're not going to shy away from the discussion. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's what's very unique about your style of writing and your worldview. So I'm hoping to see more of it. Because I think that if we have discussions around diversity, equity, inclusion, racism in a constructive way, I think more people will be in that conversation. They're not going to feel bad about it. Absolutely. That's that's what I'm hoping as well. So I really am grateful for the feedback. This is awesome. So obviously, I've read your background. I've actually seen some of your work before as well. What made you want to write the book now? Because you've had quite a storied career. Did you feel the moment was right to bring a new conversation to this? Well, that's interesting because I, you know, have been doing this work my whole career. And 2020, um, as you can imagine, was a, quite a, a huge turning point for the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. Um, and during that time period, um, you know, executives continuously asked me, like they would ask me in big meetings, they would pull me aside, you know, one on one yes. and ask, me, you know, OK, so I hear everything you're saying. Where are we on the journey? And not only where are we on the journey, how do we know if we're making progress? And once I got that question five and 10 and 20 and 30 plus times in a very short amount of time period, I said, you know, because there's so much already out there, I was surprised that it seemed to not be a, a framework that people could really understand what it looked like to be on the DEI journey, especially at the organizational level. Yes. And so it like many, you know, books that come about because there was a gap that I saw and a clear need um, that I felt from, you know, the clients that yes. I was working with and the students that, that I teach. 
What's very surprising in a pleasant way about the way you've written it is that, yes, you've done this your whole life. You've obviously seen progress made, steps being taken back. I'm sure at times you felt we've not done enough, but I don't sense any frustration in your writing. How is it possible you keep such a positive outlook on celebrating the successes and, and empathizing with the actors? How do you do that? Well, I you know, I, I would be remiss if I said frustration was not in my spirit yes. um, for some things not changing. But again, if I'm frustrated because it's not changed, I have to do everything I can in my power to make sure there will be change in the future. And so just coming from a place of frustration, there's a place for, you know, anger and frustration yes. in social movements, certainly. Um, but there's also a place for coming to a place of understanding and dialogue and getting to the core issues. Because usually anger is not the core issue for, for anything, yeah. right? In communication. Yeah. Usually there's something beneath that layer of emotion. And I think that's where I try to focus. I also know that, you know, for me personally, if I was not optimistic of sorts, not unrealistically optimistic, but if I did not have a, a mindset and a heart of optimism, I couldn't do this work. Um, as a Black woman, I would not be able to continue to, you know, get questions that are sometimes offensive or hear yes. people's perspectives that are, you know, if if I had the power of right and wrong, I would say they're wrong. But that's not the way I, I can. I have to look at it. I have to look at it like everyone's perspective is valuable and there's something I can learn, even if I disagree. It's okay to disagree, but if I do it in a way that is inviting dialogue, we can hopefully get to the, the deeper layer um, issues and really get to some solutions versus just sitting in a place of anger or frustration. So when I read some of the chapters, the one in PwC really jumped out at me because I felt a lot of the people, these are powerful people, captains of industry, were very honest mm -hmm. about their shortcomings. How did you get them to the point where they were willing to share such deep insights about themselves? Well, you know, some of the credit must go to them, to be honest. Yes. There were plenty of organizations and plenty of leaders that said no when they realized what I was doing. And, you know, to your yes. point, I promised them that I was not trying to paint anyone in a negative light, but I did tell them that I wanted to be honest. And I think that people who are truly on this DEI journey and truly understand the value of transparency understand that it helps people to move forward if they can understand some of the challenges that that an organization or a leader has had. Um, and so the companies who ended up, you know, really moving forward in this space were able to be honest and they, they understood that it was actually going to help more people by being honest about some of their pitfalls um, versus pretending everything is perfect. You know, I think that it's really clear <laughs> that that you know no no company is perfect yes and so even when we try to say that you know well we don't want people to know our dirty laundry well we know you're not perfect we can look at yes. your executive exactly team, the lack of diversity there so that's a mindset shift that i asked many of my clients to start to make um over the past few years like i know it's uncomfortable to share your demographic data with your company but they already know there's not much diversity. So all you're doing is telling them how much there is and, and where we want to go, right? And I think that was the same posture that many of the companies that I interviewed with, um, they had. They said, hey, we're not perfect. And we know that we've done some great things, but we can have some ways to go. And th that's the voice that I wanted to come out loud and clear. Even a company like PwC, that is phenomenal when yes. it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and has been for many years, for decades, they're still not perfect. They still have work to do. They're still ever growing and learning. And I think we all must take that mindset, which is you know, why I, I will say every single time I talk about the, the maturity model, it doesn't end. There are those five steps that I have outlined and hopefully have illustrated through these stories. But for none of the organizations, is their journey over? The journey must continue to evolve. As long as you have humans working in your workplace, your journey will continue to evolve as humanity continues to evolve. And I think that's what's very, very powerful about the selection of case studies. These are well-known progressive companies. I mean, PwC is a titan in its field. As you say, it's always been ahead of the curve. And when you read a story about PwC doing a lot, but also having more 
to do on this journey, it makes it easier to have the conversation because you know that there's no one getting it right. And I think that's the power of the selection of the stories. Was that the goal to pick these leaders to show people that everyone's struggling at it? Absolutely. Like my one of my number one goals in writing this as a narrative format is one to, to tell stories in a way that brought this really difficult topic to life for people. Like I really wanted to demystify what DEI was all about. So many re- people think of DEI as those big moments, those big yes. tough topics. And it is that, right? But it's not just that. DEI is also about how people are treated every day in the workplace, how you feel when you go to work. What feelings come to mind when it's Monday morning and you know it's time to tap back into the workplace? Yeah. All of that is a part of your feelings of inclusion and belonging. And and even if you want to advance in that organization, that's your feelings around whether it's equitable or not, right? So these are the everyday feelings. And I wanted to demystify what DEI was all about in this book. Um, The second thing is I wanted every single person, no matter their level, no matter their industry, no matter where they are on their personal DEI journey or where their organization is on their DEI journey, I wanted them to be able to pick out some part of uh, themselves in the book. So whether they really, you know, connect with one of the leaders that was struggling with this, with, you know, their journey, whether they really connect with one of the organizations that had some big mess ups and had to kind of clean it up and really write the course, whether they identify with the fact that, you know, organizations like Slack are really grassroots efforts. They don't have a chief diversity officer. In whatever place the person is reading it, whether they're a manager that leads hundreds of people or they're an individual just trying to learn more, I wanted them to be able to see themselves in the journey so they could be able to bring it to life. Yeah, you raise a very important point, which I think is getting lost in the conversation. Because we're capitalists, we have this philosophy of measuring things. But we could reach a point where the numbers look good, but people still don't feel comfortable. And what you say makes the most sense whereby it's not just whether we get the numbers right, but whether people feel accepted. And there's not enough focus on that. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I I would say even more than accepted, because accepted, I think, is terminology that I even use for most of my career. We got to push that. They have to be welcomed. Because when when you are accepting um, something, you're just kind of okay with it, right? Uh, Like if you bring your significant other to meet your parents and they say oh I accept this person um that's okay but you're not really excited <laughs> they say I accept yes, your, your future that's a good spouse, point right you want them to welcome your future response you want them to be excited about it you want they, them to feel like they can be integrated uh into your family right and so I think of that as a mindset shift that's needed but absolutely we want people to feel not only accepted, but welcomed, invited, excited to to have them present. And I think that is what I want for every single person in every single organization. And yes, that's idealistic, right? Which is why I have that concept of workplace utopia, but I don't think it's out of reach. I don't think it's out of reach for every person to be in a workplace that they are able to thrive and whatever that means for them and for them to have managers who care about their ability to thrive. Um, and so, yeah, that that's the core of, of the work um, in the book that I tried to push forward. I don't think it's idealistic. I remember when I used to be a senior partner in consulting, as we know, there's a lot of discrimination against Jewish people then and now, and also gay people, right? And I remember when we were going through the recruiting efforts, I felt that some of the partners were not hiring people because of their sexual orientation. So I made an active effort to recruit gay people and Jewish people. And I remember we also had something called Pink Day, where people had to wear pink ties and so on. And the point Mm -hmm. you make about welcoming them, actively seeking out people because you feel that they are not being appreciated and you can create a place whereby they will love working there. And that really changed things because I remember people would refer colleagues to come in and interview with us because we created this environment where they felt they could just be themselves and everything was good for them. So I think that slight change in terminology is actually, it's a significant thing. You know, you say accepting versus welcoming them, whereby you go out and you actively create a space they feel enjoyment in. I think that's a big mindset shift. Absolutely. And I think we need that, right? I think that 
the language that we use is important. The way that we activate on these ideals is important. So it's not enough to just say we believe in an environment where everyone can thrive. What are we doing to yes. make that happen? And I love that example that you just provided of, you know, what actions you took. You noticed there was a problem. You noticed there was something that did not, you know, meet the needs Did not was not that workplace utopia for everyone. And you made a change. You used your sphere of influence, which I talk about in the book a lot is use your sphere of influence to make a change. And you know what? It doesn't have to be a groundbreaking change. It can be an everyday change. It can be just getting one or two more people into the pipeline of the organization or checking in with one or two colleagues to make sure they're feeling included. Um, and that's exactly why that concept of sphere of influence is so critical. At the organizational level, it's about looking internally to externally around their sphere of influence. But um, at the individual level, we each have a sphere of influence as well. Some of us have larger or smaller spheres of influence. Some of us is more central to our family and the people that we see every yes. day. Others of us, we have huge platforms like you all do with this podcast and or, you know, as I do in the classroom at Georgetown, where I teach hundreds of students every single year, our sphere of influence varies. But what is clear is that we can each have a positive impact on someone else's journey um, if we just have that intention. Yes, and it's often little things that have the biggest impact. I remember once we were doing a major engagement in Saudi Arabia. And when you're selecting the teams, you have to be sensitive to local culture. And to lead the team, I sent in who I thought was the best person on my team, who also happens to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the partners were saying, this doesn't make sense. Why would you send this guy into Saudi Arabia? And I said, he's the best for the job. There's nothing dangerous about him being in Saudi Arabia. He's going to be in a five-star hotel working in an air-conditioned office. He's the best for the job. If we tell the client he's the best for the job, they will accept it. And the thing is, oftentimes we protect people, but we don't know that we're hurting them. And in this situation, it really changed the dynamic in the office when we sent the best person for the job and didn't hold them back because of some perceived challenge they would face. And I think we often do that. We think we're protecting people, but sometimes we're hurting them. Do you think that happens enough? Uh, that's really interesting. So say a little bit more about how that person, you know, was hurt. Like, how did you come to the awareness that that person was negatively impacted by seemingly positive intent? And I ask that because I often talk about the gap between intent yeah. versus impact. Uh, we can have positive intent, but we must circle back and understand what was the actual impact of our actions or our words or making that position change. Well, let me give you the background because the audience would also want to know the background. So that particular time, we were doing a lot of work in the Middle East, Qatar, Dubai, and Saudi Arabia was a big push for us. But what would happen is that there was a feeling with some partners that if we put certain consultants in certain cultures, they would feel uncomfortable. And then the partners would hold them back from those engagements. But here's the thing. Those are very important engagements. If you kept a consultant out of that engagement, they wouldn't get the training and development they would need to be good consultants. So when it came to performance review times, you'd, we'd be holding these people back, but then we'd give them the feedback that they didn't get the necessary exposure they needed, and that would affect their progression through the firm. So that's a, an exact example whereby the partners thought they were helping these consultants, but at the end of the day, they were not giving them the exposure to progress. And I thought that was unfair because it's the consultant's decision whether or not they want to be in that environment. We just have to protect them as best as we can. Is that sufficient context? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think it's 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 what I said before is that intent versus impact, right? Um, and, you know, this often comes up when we talk about microaggressions, for example. Um, I didn't mean to say that, but I have to yes. acknowledge the impact that my words or actions have had on you. We see it at, at the organizational level as well. You know, we put up our pride flag on June 1st every year. Um, and then we take it down at the end of the month. And some employees are really upset that, that they feel like that's the only thing we do the whole year. And so yes. they don't actually feel more included with the fact that you put the pride flag up for one month out the year. They want you to do things that are more impactful or more touching to them or in addition to that, right? So those are examples at the micro and macro level. We always have to be checking for 
uh, unintended impact of, of the things that we do. And so the example you shared is absolutely falls in that category. Um, and, you know, what do we do when we realize that something that had a, a pure uh, intention didn't yes. meet the mark, right? There was a miss there. I think the first thing you have to do is own it. So in, in my book, I talk about the power of those pitfalls, right? Being willing to acknowledge where you missed the mark, what didn't go as planned, where you need to course correct. And again, that might sound easy, but so many people at the individual and organizational level, we don't like to admit that we didn't, we didn't get it quite yes. right the first time, especially the higher up in leadership you go, the harder it is to admit mistakes, especially on these topics, right? Because you're afraid of what people will think. You're afraid of judgment and it doesn't feel good to have hurt someone's feelings or to realize you didn't allow someone the same opportunity as someone else. For most people that have good intentions, that reality doesn't feel good, but you have to face that reality so that you can close the gap. You can make the necessary change. And so what I would ask is, you know, once you realize that that gap was present and the impact was not what you intended, what changes were made? How did you all navigate that once you realized it? Yes. And I think employees, companies need to have more of a mindset that they have a relationship with their employees. And as with any relationship, you have to invest in it. You have to take time to see how the relationship is working. You have to cost correct. So it's almost as if people are hired, they go through an orientation, and then it's left to HR to manage these issues because it's not an HR issue. This is a company issue. This should be sitting with the CEO. Absolutely. And not only should there be accountability at the very top with the CEO, this is not just an HR issue. This is everyone's responsibility. It's one of the, the number one myths I like to debunk when I first start a conversation with a new group or a new leader, because the first thing people think is that this is an HR's wheelhouse or if we have a chief diversity officer, this is something for them to focus on. But the reality is, and the mindset change, mindset change that must happen is that diversity, equity, and inclusion is every single person's responsibility within an organization. Again, think about that sphere of influence. You know, some of us have more responsibility yeah. if we're the CEO or if we're the chief diversity officer, absolutely. But it does not negate the individual accountability that everyone in the organization must have um, to, to acknowledge that creating an environment where everyone feels welcomed and valued is everyone's responsibility. Um, and, and that's why I'm so adamant that the best DEI strategies are both top down and bottom up. And I don't say that just to use business, you know, lingo. Yeah. It truly has to be something that every person in the organization recognizes how they play a role. Even on the front lines, even if you're an individual contributor, you play a role in how your teammates experience you. You play a role in how your teammates, um, how you all communicate as a team, how decisions are made at that level. If you're a manager, you're responsible for much more and you continue up the organization, but every single person has an, has an opportunity to have an impact. Yes. And I think it comes down to the culture of the company because that's what we're talking about here. We're trying to change the culture of a company so that it sees having DEI as a competitive advantage and it makes it a priority to make it as welcoming a place as possible. So oftentimes when I talk to executives about this, they tend to forget that by doing this, we're going to be altering the culture of the company for the better. They often treat it almost as a financial yardstick. They need to hit, hire a certain number of people. They'll hit their goals, but they don't understand they're going through a cultural journey. Have you seen that with your clients as well? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, the thing is that people talk about culture, but they don't realize that it takes a long time to change culture. It's probably yes. one of the hardest things to change, which is a good thing if your culture is where you want it to be. It's a bad thing if you're trying to change your culture because it takes time. Yes. Um, and culture is a, a group level phenomenon. And what I mean by that is that one person, no matter how dynamic or how terrible they are, they can't change the culture. Uh, they can influence the culture, but culture is something that we collectively buy into and that lives and breathes every day in what we do and how we get things done in an organization. So even if we have a fantastic dynamic leader, if that leader leaves, a sign that they have impacted the culture is that the culture can still remain intact, yes. even if 
that leader leaves. And so, yes, people struggle with that, that notion. Um, and they struggle with the fact that unlike other business imperatives and DEI should very much be a business imperative, but the way that it's different is that you're dealing with people, you're dealing with humans, you're dealing with, with imperfect, uh, situations. And it, the impact and the intent is not always a one-to-one -one ratio, even at the organizational level, right? We have to understand that, you know, from a marketing perspective or a finance perspective, we're used to like putting numbers in place, putting a plan in order, implementing said planning and the results spit out, right? And we can do all that. And the results still don't match. And that's really frustrating. But why is that? Well, because we're dealing with people. We're dealing with humans. We're dealing with emotion. We're yes. dealing with individual perspectives and experiences and shared values and unshared values, right? There's so many dynamics. And so this is not to say that you won't see progress. You absolutely will see progress, especially if you're intentional and you have both short-term and long-term goals that you're tracking towards. But you have to understand that it's not as simple as plugging things into a formula and expecting culture change to be sped out. Yes. I mean, we talk about in consulting, we use the word change management. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yes. But in the change management programs that I've been a part of, they're multi-year efforts and they never really stop, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So there's accountability, there's processes in place and so on. It's not as if it's just a few emails you send off or you, as, as you mentioned earlier, having one day of celebrating a certain group of people, it's an ongoing effort. It changes everything about the company, the way they speak, the way they communicate, how often they meet, what they talk about, how they remunerate people, what they prioritize, what they deprioritize. It's a whole change they go through. And oftentimes when I look at efforts companies make on DEI, it's not a whole change they try to execute. It's yeah. almost as if they're treating it as a project that someone somewhere else has to fix. And, and you know what? Oftentimes they treat it as not only just a project, but a program. They think yeah. about their program as like, oh, we have a strong DEI program. So that's our DEI strategy. That is not the same thing. Um, but, I, but I love that you're talking about it at, from a change management perspective. This is how I teach on this topic for my students. And you know what's critical to a change management process is resistance, resistors and, and resistance yes. to the change. And that's one of those things that we think about as a, purely a negative thing. And in change management, we know that resistance is part of the process. Yeah. Sometimes resistance can help make us better. People who are resisting the change help us to understand why they're resisting it. What are some areas we haven't thought about? Maybe what are some unintended consequences of the change? So if we can understand our resistance and get those people who are resistors to come over to our side and, and be a part of the change, that is powerful. If you've ever had someone change your mind about something, you remember what exactly they yeah. said or what happened to change your mind. And so that's another piece of the puzzle that I would love people to really understand is that resistance does happen. But that doesn't mean right off that person who's refusing to add their pronouns to their email signature. It doesn't mean right off. That means try to understand what is it they're scared of? What is it that they're uncomfortable with? What are they thinking that that would signal? You can learn so much. And maybe at the end of the day, they, they understand your perspective and add those pronouns to their email signature, or maybe they don't. But I guarantee you, your ability to advocate on behalf of all people in the organization, especially those who um, are, are supported in their gender identity with pronouns, will be better. You will be a better advocate and ally um, once you understand that perspective of, of those people who may not agree with you. Yes. I used to be a corporate strategy partner, but I have worked on some change management programs. And I remember the first time I was put on a change management program and it's the CEO of the company asked for me to be in the program because he wanted a strategy person working with the change management team. In my first meeting, I sent out a very articulate email explaining the logic mm -hmm. and the business case behind why we need to do this. And nobody responded. Then <laughs> I had to go speak speak to people one-on-one -on -one. and I had to speak to them about the same topic eight times until they changed their mind. So, you know, you come from a strategy background, you think everything's going to work on logic, The numbers make mm -hmm. sense. They're going to do it, but they're not going to do it because 
whenever people see something changing, they think about what is going to happen for their jobs, their positions of power, and their future. And an email doesn't build trust. You've got to look them in the eye and make them believe that you have their best interests at heart. And I think that's a lot of what happens with DEI is it's too logic-based versus understanding that people are people, they are scared. Oftentimes when people resist you, it's not because they want to be difficult, it's because it's their response when they are under threat. And a lot of people see change as a threat to their power, balance of authority, and so on. Well, it and is I think, a threat. And it's I think a threat people, to the status yes. quo. It, is. It, it, it very much is. You know, change, any change is a threat to the status quo. Quo. That's what makes it change. Um, but you know, helping people to understand that that does not mean that you will not have a position um, of authority or that yes. your voice won't be valued, um, you know, is important. So yeah, we are definitely trying to shift the status quo with diversity, equity, and inclusion, just like any other change effort. But I think to your point, we have to get people to understand that doesn't mean that it's a threat to you. It yes. doesn't mean it's threat to your ability to continue on making an impact in the organization to be valued and all of those wonderful things. But yeah, we do have to change the status quo if we do want to see change. And it takes a long time. That was the point I also was raising. Eight conversations with some people on the same topic, and then only they would change. So it's not something that happens quickly, but if you do it well and you lay the right foundation, you build you know, for lack of a better word, a coalition of the willing who will support the changes coming. But if we try to rush it through it without talking to people and getting their viewpoints, it's going to stall at some point. And I think a lot of companies don't take the time to do it correctly. Absolutely. And, and not only do they not take the time to do it correctly, they don't want to invest the time to see the real progress. Um, they want yes. the the, the short-term wins, they want the, the the things they can easily change, but those macro level, more you know significant changes do take time and people have to be willing to invest it, which is why I think it's critical to have that mindset shift that this is not something that's just going to go away. Once you, you know, make the change, it doesn't mean that you're never going to have to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion again. If you truly are invested in DEI, you will always be thinking about DEI. Now, what I hope is that you are now talking about different issues, new ways of thinking about the workplace, new generations entering the workplace yeah. and how we can best serve them. I hope the conversation shifts and changes, but it's not going away. <laughs> so No, it's not that... going away. But I also think that for a lot of executives, quite a fair number of them, they always talk about it being the right thing to do. But I'm thinking, no, this is an economic case. It's a competitive advantage to be this way. Because if you think of it as the right thing to do, it's almost as if you're doing social work. Mm -hmm. When I hear the thing, it's the right thing to do, that means the executive doesn't understand the economic benefit of doing it. They're treating it almost like a charity. Yeah. As opposed to you viewing it as if we do this right, we're going to beat our competitors. No, absolutely. And, you know, the the moral case and business case arguments are are classic in the world of diversity, equity, yeah. and inclusion. And the moral case is is that of which it's the right thing to do. It tugs at your heartstrings. It makes you feel like a good person. But the reality is, if the moral case was enough, then we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so the same can be said about the business case. There has been an economic argument. Um, for, you know, diversity yes. and inclusion and equity, you know, since forever, especially if you think back to the United States, right, and, and there was an economic argument for slavery existing, and there was one that slavery should not exist. Yes. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, even for the slaves to be emancipated was an economic and kind of political business decision uh, by President Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if we look to the economic argument that's been made for a very long time, that still hasn't been enough. And so what I truly think is that we have to have both the moral case and the business case. And when morality wanes, motivation wanes, that business case is, is what's going to really uh, keep businesses specifically um, fighting the fight around diversity, equity, inclusion, still engaged. Um, the morality case is helpful. Uh, we do need it, but it by itself cannot create the lasting change, especially 
in the business world. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because like you said, you know, charity work, you know, people don't want to think they're doing charity work because at the end of the day, if we're talking about for-profit businesses, um, when you take away the motivation for profit, then you're now, you're now a charity, right? And yeah. so that's not what organizations want to see themselves as, certainly. So we have to take that same uh, perspective uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what do you think would be the next steps in the journey we're going through on DEI? Because we've obviously, as you said very well, we will always be going on the journey, but we should be discussing different issues as we mature through the journey. So as things stand out, what would be some of the discussions companies should be having, now, given all companies are different, but what do you think are the best practices or the things that you've seen be helpful for companies? Okay, so can you phrase it just a, a little bit differently? I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding the core question here. Sure, so if we have a CEO listening to this podcast and he says, he or she says, okay, on Monday morning, I'm gonna convene my leadership team and I'm not going to have a discussion with them on DEI. What would be the primary issues that they should be discussing in starting this conversation? Absolutely. So no matter where you are on your organizational journey, um, I would ask that CEO to go into that meeting and have the three P's in mind. Purpose, pitfalls, and progress. What is our purpose? Why is this important to us? Yes, it's the right thing to do, but how does it connect to who we are as a business? How does it connect to our mission and values? How does it connect to our business strategy? What is our purpose? What are we trying to achieve? The second thing is pitfalls. Now, once we've defined that purpose and, and have alignment on that, we got to be honest, what's held us back? You know, what are those things that we've missed the mark on? And then progress. What does progress look like tangibly in this organization? Not what it looks like for everyone else. What does it look like in five years for these efforts to have been achieved? What is the change that we want to see? And then how do we make sure we're measuring that progress in a tangible way, both qualitatively and quantitatively? So if a CEO is thinking, okay, I want to reignite our DEI strategy, those are the three things I would tell them to go into their meeting Monday morning and talk about. So it's basics. It's going back to the basics. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't have to be rocket science. <laughs> it's yes, just at, at the core, you know, at the core of this work, it, for me, it's about elevating humanity in the workplace. Now, that sounds easy and, and maybe that's a basic, right? Humanity in the workplace. But we know it's hard. And so, yes, even the basics, you know, going back to the basics, they do take time and, and effort. And it, it's that reflective process that's the, the hardest challenge. And so for that CEO, I might also ask them to, you know, before they go into that meeting, interrogate where they truly are on their DEI journey. Because we know there's an individual journey and there's an organizational journey. And sometimes those journeys do not match. Even if you're the leader of a company, the company may be further along than you are as an individual or vice versa. But you got to be honest about that too. And when you're honest about what are the, some of the things that are holding you back, maybe on your individual journey, got to help you be a better leader. You don't have to be perfect, but it does take for you to be honest and transparent about that. Yes, that's well said. One of the little experiments and tests I do, which is my own little system of measuring things, is that I obviously read a lot of memoirs of CEOs once they retire and they look back on their lives. And one of the things I check for and I keep a record of this is that what are the common things CEOs are proud of when they look back on their lives? And one of the things I find striking is how little, how few of those books talk about initiatives around DEI. So CEOs talk about how they led a merger, how they rescued a business. But that tells you that when people are looking back on their lives, it doesn't matter what they said when they were CEO, but when they do a, a measure of their success, DEI doesn't seem to be on their radar. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be a very telling thing. That is really fascinating. Um, I've learned something in this conversation. You know, I think because a lot of leaders, again, they think about DEI as the, those big things, the big initiatives. But I wonder, 
if you brought it down to the level of DEI is about how people feel in your organization, how people feel around each other, if they feel a sense of belonging, do they feel like they're welcomed? Are they celebrated? Are their ideas acknowledged and integrated into what's happening in the business? Do they feel like they have opportunities to help make decisions? I bet if you put that lens on it, then more of the CEO's experience would reflect them being proud of those types of things. Because I do think CEOs are really proud when people love working in their organization and they they spend their whole careers, you know, committed to their particular organization. Um, but you certainly do bring up, you know, one of the challenges in this space. It, because it all comes down to the things we say and the things we write, which tells people what we value. And of course, it inspires younger people to think and act in a certain way. But I think you are right. CEOs do obviously care about their employees and their well-being and so on. So maybe through a different lens, it would come out if you do the analysis again. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a very fascinating thing because it's a topic that everyone talks about. I mean, DI is pretty much, if you read any major newspaper, it's a constant topic. But I find there's always different camps whereby if you read newspaper articles, there are people who try to make it into almost an aggressive topic. And then there's a camp, and I think you fit in that camp, whereby you focus on what is the solution? How do we move forward? How do we celebrate what's working and then take a step back and see what's not working and then move forward as a group? How do we find common ground on this? So do you feel that the kind of conversations we're having now in the media around DEI, do you think they're working? Are they helping people understand what's happening? Are they encouraging conversations? I think they are. I, I think that, you know, so many more organizations are having what they call courageous conversations or candid dialogue. Again, the, the big moments, <laughs> they're having programs around that. Yes. But what I am hoping is that, you know, those big courageous conversation days turn into those courageous conversation moments that happen every single day. I like so that. I, I do think we're having more of these. I do think we're making progress. Is it fast enough? Of course not. Am I worried that people will, you know, you know, take their foot off the pedal? I am. But I do think, you know, having these conversations, pushing the needle forward is, is the right path to be on. Yes. You know, in listening to you speak, I'm almost going to encourage you to maybe try to get a column in the Wall Street Journal or New York Times on the subject. Well, that's very kind. If you if you know the best pathway to do that, let me know. <laughs> I'll think of it. I do know a couple of people there because I think the way you speak about this topic is almost soothing is the way I would use to describe it. Uh, it's You have a rare skill of being able to take a very complex and controversial subject as it is, but you've created a way to almost create a path for people to have the conversation and take some steps and I think it's a very rare skill because I speak to many authors and professionals. Some have it, some don't have it, most don't have it, and you have that skill. You have an ability to actually get people to make progress on a very difficult subject. Well, thank you. And, and I would welcome that opportunity. Um, so if you have ideas, I'll also take that back to my team. Thank you for the suggestion. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap up for the audience? I would say, you know, DEI is hard. It's hard work. It is. But every journey starts with the first step. And I think if we can really understand that this is a, a lifelong commitment, um, this is not something that is going to change overnight, but every single step forward you take is forward motion, is progress. And I just want people to be encouraged that, you know, their efforts are not in vain um, and we can get to a place where there is a workplace utopia for every single person. I like that. A workplace utopia for every single person. That's a good phrase. I mean, that is the goal, right? That is absolutely the goal. At least my goal, which is why. No, I love that. After I, I, you know, I end, I end with the question. So I'll keep that that same um, energy here and, and ask you, what is your workplace utopia? I like that. That's a good ending point. You know, what's the interesting thing about this is that Many people have this view is that they should just be lucky to be employed. And I think some employers take that view that people should be lucky that we employed them. But if we take the view of saying, look, we're going to work together. Why don't we make it the best possible experience for everyone? That would be amazing. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Ella, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. 
one of the best conversations I've had this year and is definitely one of the best books I've read this year. Thank you so much, Michael. I, I would love to keep in touch and appreciate the conversation today and the review. <laughs> yes, we'll definitely keep in touch and hopefully we'll have you back on the podcast later as well. It'd be my pleasure. Take care. Ciao. All right. Bye now.